In the course of his near three-year decade career in the Canadian Armed Forces, Stéphane Grenier spent 10 months in the mid-1990s in Rwanda during that country's civil war. He helped document the genocide that killed an estimated 800,000 Rwandans. He then spent 10 years confronting the military's mental health system as he battled post-traumatic stress disorder. He went on to found Mental Health Innovators, a peer support organization, and has now written a brutally honest memoir called After the War, Surviving PTSD and Changing Mental Health Culture. Stéphane Grenier retired with the rank Lieutenant Colonel, and he joins us now for more. So nice to have you back here in our studio. Thank you. This is a grueling, grueling account, and we are going to go through it. We're going to take the time to go through it. I kind of feel I should apologize at first for making you bring all this up again, but here we go. Let's start with this. Why did you feel a need to be so graphic and so candid in telling the story? I think that what I do today needs to be founded in some sort of, of backdrop. And I think the success we have today with organizations that we work with is founded on the fact that what we lean in, when we lean into an organization and we help them change the way things are, we, we go back to what was wrong in our organizations. Because I have a team of people and we've learned through the University of Life what is missing. And I thought that sharing the pathway to today was important to set the context. But so graphically, I mean, even early on in the book, I can, I mean, I'm still got it in my head. You're coming upon that young girl lying on the ground, dead, her head cut open. I mean, this, you saw some horrendous things. Why the need to describe them in such detail? So for uh, about six, seven years now, I've been put on the speaker's circuit and the National Speakers Bureau, the Speaker Spotlight, and uh, Conférence Horizon in Quebec. And I remember receiving advice uh, in the, my early years as a speaker that I should be sharing those graphic images and things like that, and I never did that. I never did that because when you have an hour with an audience to inspire how we should move forward in Canada, how we should transform our mental health system, I didn't find it was helpful to focus on that and create a bit of a pity party around, oh, poor Stefani had a tough time in Rwanda. I thought the hour is so, it, I cherish that hour with my audience and I want to really focus on what they should think about for the future as we change our mental health system. Writing a book to me was perhaps the opportunity to honor that request uh, uh, because I never honored that request. I said, no, I'm not going to tell war stories during a keynote. Mm -hmm. However, if you want to know, then you can read the book. It's your choice, but I'm not going to expose you to this. If you want to know, buy the book. And now the book is out. How therapeutic to do this? Zero. Really? Zero. Not at for all? Me. No, because I think I've dealt with those things. Uh, and actually, a psychiatrist friend of mine who works in Hamilton and a psychologist friend of his encouraged me to write the book. And over the years, I was told you should write the book. And uh, it's, it's really through mild peer pressure or, or colleague pressure that I wrote the book. But no, uh, what I find hard, though, is now that it's all in one book, except a few anecdotes which were taken out of the book for, for content, mm. um, it's sort of hard to be all in this book because up until today I could choose what I share for my kids my mm -hmm. ex-wife right her parents your grandchild my grandchild that's right and so but that's okay uh, I, I, I have no ego this is not a pity party this is human beings are put through the grinder through life and you don't have to go to war to develop a mental health problem everyday Canadians develop these issues and to me, it's about changing the mental health system. And, uh, and if you're not willing to put you, yourself out there, then you're not a leader. Let's set this up some more. Here is an excerpt from the book. Sheldon, if you would, bring this graphic up. I was pretty gung-ho in the early stages of my career, especially after joining the Canadian Armored Corps. Unfortunately, the narrative I envisioned in my head, bravely keeping the peace and making my country proud, had little to do with the horrors I witnessed 11 years later. You arrived May 1994. There was supposedly a ceasefire when you got there. What do you remember from your first few days in Rwanda? Now, the smell, I mean, it's, it's such a culture clash, right? And I, well, the book talks about the arrival, the landing in a torrential rainstorm, and there was three or four inches of water in the tarmac, poor drainage, doesn't rain often. When it rain, rains in Rwanda or many countries, it just floods everywhere and the flooding goes away. But for sure, you know, I had been to funerals, like most Canadians, uh, and so, but, but death was now taking a, a different dimension, for sure. 
And um, what I had been socialized to understand is you live your life, people die, people die of old age, people die in accidents, you mourn and all this. There was uh, the mourning and the grieving there was, of course, I wasn't Rwandan, but none of us, none of my colleagues or, or me could be insensitive to what was happening around mm -hmm. us. But at the end of the day, uh, even though there's so much emphasis on the word post-traumatic stress disorder, I can't remember one single event that traumatized me in the pure sense of the word. However, it was like death by a thousand paper cuts. Mm. You know, like the, the daily grind, the week, yeah, yeah, the cumulative wear and tear. Mm. Uh, and I think the first couple of days were big, big cuts that probably uh, heal over time, but don't heal as, as, as well as they should. And then you cut on top of the cuts. Right? What was your mission when you first arrived? was basically to support uh, Romeo Dallaire. I mean, the, the country is a, a French-Canadian-speaking co country. Mm -hmm. So when we were looking for uh, people at National Defense Headquarters, of course, having at least a bilingual person or a French person was, was top of mind. All of his officers and headquarters were francophone. And when I went there initially, it was to bring uh, a series of journalists into the country because at that point in time, all media and all for, uh, expats had left the country. So it was basically no one less. And, and Romeo Dallaire was asking uh, for, for an, uh, the ability to tell the world what was happening in Rwanda. Did you have any sense before you got there, any, any in-depth briefings or any, anything of significance before arriving to prepare you for what you were about to see? Operationally, yes. So tactically, yes. From a risk perspective, from a, um, a tropical disease perspective, Preparation on that is no problem. But, um, and I have to say that the operation went fine, and then I came back to Canada, then went back for, for, for the, uh, the full tour of duty. Operationally, military speaking, there was no issues. But the moral conflict, the cumulative wear and tear, the death by the thousand paper cuts was at the time the issue, and I think is still the issue today. And if we look at our our first responder community, our trauma-exposed workplaces, police, fire, paramedics. Uh, that is the nature of the problem. I think we, as a, as a country, we really need to rally around these workplaces and support these people appropriately because we, we are doing a disservice to, to, to all these, these uniformed people. One more excerpt from the book. Here we go. Documenting genocide. We parked our vehicles in the knee-high grass, glanced around and started walking towards the church. As we made our approach, the grass gradually became flatter and flatter. And once we got a little closer to the church, we understood why. The ground was completely littered with corpses, which from afar, because of months of rain, decomposition, and the tattered clothes the victims had been wearing, looked like dirt and garbage. There were adults and children of all ages, several thousand of them. How does a person who has seen this ever come back to his home country and, quote unquote, be normal again? Well, I, th I think I say in the book that when I stepped off the flight, I now look back as that being the first day of the rest of my life. My norm is not what it used to be. Yeah. I think the, a new norm sets in. For me, the new norm is, is uh, is, is I, 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 I'm, in, I'm in recovery now. I know how to deal with these things, right? But um, yeah, that's a really hard question to answer because normal is not what it used to be. You're never going to be That's right, but healing again. means that you're okay with the new norm. And I remember being in the, uh, Peter Boyles is gonna, my, my psychiatrist is gonna have a chuckle here when I say, I remember saying to him, is this as good as it gets? And he looked at me and he said, yes. And I said, thank you. Now I know that I can, I'm going to cope with this, and it's going to be OK. You knew what you were up against now. Exactly. And that blunt honesty from a psychiatrist to say, you know what? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and from that moment on, I was able to, to, to sort of accept my new norm. Hmm. Uh, so norm doesn't have to be the same, right? And I think that's, that's the value of that recovery philosophy, and also normalizing this is extremely helpful when you have the support of colleagues, right? Where you understand that it's never gonna be like it used to be, but it's gonna be okay. Doctors, you know, Dr. Boyle's honesty that day was instrumental. 
but the support of others around me, which is my passion now to create these support systems for people, was instrumental as well. The Dr. Boyle that you just complimented, yeah. um, you had some other expressions for some other psychiatrists who yes. you said often misunderstand and underestimate the moral conflict that lies at the center of traumatic events. How so? I think that um, we have overemphasized the word trauma and we have put, unbeknownst to ourselves, unbeknownst to the American and Canadian psychiatric associations, too much value in focusing only on the trauma part of what happens to human beings when they're exposed to abnormal situations. And there is a spectrum of feelings that a human being goes through when he or she is exposed to things that are outside the everyday norm, right? And it's not black or white, it's not green or red, mm. it's on a spectrum. And therefore, when you have a really bad experience, you can be disturbed, you can be upset. You don't necessarily need to be traumatized to need help. Mm. But in our world now, uh, even in Ontario, the presumptive legislation for PTSD, for first responders, I don't think that is a mistake. It is a move in the right direction, but there are unintended consequences to this. Because what it's basically saying, Stephen, is that for those who develop PTSD from their work environment, you will be looked after. But what about the 50% of people who don't develop PTSD? Clinical research shows that when you expose somebody to a lot of hardship, like a police officer, half of those people who need help will not have PTSD. So what are we doing for those people? If they don't have the right diagnosis now, you're helping one, so you have haves and have-nots. It's like telling somebody who falls off a ladder, I wish you would have broken your arm because we only cover arms. You broke your leg, you're out of luck, mm. right? So it's very important that as we move forward, governments, the medical field, the researchers look at the bigger picture. And I contend, I have a problem. I'm not sure it's PTSD. You said that in the book. You said, and Absolutely. in fact, because you've mentioned PTSD, it's in the title of your book, the subtitle of your book. And yet you say in the book, I'm not sure I've got that. I know, I know I'm affected, but you're not sure it's PTSD. That's right. Do you know what it is? I think it is, I am affected by suffering from a huge dose of moral conflict. Hmm. Morally conflicted every day for nine months in a huge way, tips. And I think I talk about the moral compass, right? When you use a compass to navigate through the forest, your compass must be calibrated to, to the north. Where is, where is north uh, in, in this? In this uh, when you're exposed to so much moral conflict, I think your moral compass gets decalibrated to mm. some degree. Mm. And when you come back home, you're having a hard time adjusting. And I believe that that is part and parcel. So I'm not, I'm not arguing that I don't have PT, but I think in the next decade, we, and I know some researchers, a friend of mine tells me that, a psychiatrist tells me that there is research being conducted in the U.S. primarily with his support around the moral injury, the moral conflict piece, which I'm very happy to hear. Tell us about, since you've gone there now, tell us about coming home from there and an attempt to transition back into your previous life with your family. What was that like? V yeah, very difficult. Um, you, I just could not relate. I could not relate. I couldn't relate with my work. I, I, uh, I was always a busy body, and I think uh, my ex-wife would attest to that. I was always up to something and a little project here or there. But certainly after Rwanda, I could just not stand still. And when I did stand still, I would isolate tremendously because I couldn't... Uh, I, I just couldn't tolerate the noise. And it wasn't noise, but in my head it was noise. I needed to bring the volume down. So a great deal of in isolation came into, came, came into all this. And at work, I found what I was doing completely pointless and, and uh, got myself in trouble, of course, and that's in the book as well. Um, yeah, for about six, seven years, very, very troubling times. And um, as as my career, I just volunteered to go overseas because I just couldn't stick around. Is, is it, did you get enough sort of transition training from the Canadian forces after your mission was over? In other words, does anybody tell you, you know what, you are not the same person when you come home, readjusting to life back in our oh, no, home man. country. 
Do you get enough of that? No, in 95 there was absolutely there was nothing, nothing, which is why when I started my work in the mental health arena, changing the mental health culture, um, Pat Stogren, who was the commanding officer of uh, the infantry battalion in Afghanistan, was requesting something be done to slow down the repatriation of his battalion. And unbeknownst to him, I was pushing with General Couture here in Ottawa that we need to slow down that repatriation. It's, it's, it's not right for us to clean our combat boots in the driveway hmm. at home when your daughter is in a tri on a tricycle, right? And you're wondering, you know, it, it, the, the transition is too fast. So third location decompression was born. I can't take credit for that. Pat Stogren was requesting it, but it was certainly a passion of mine to slow down that reintegration. So we're better now than we were 20 years ago at that kind of thing. I believe so, but I, yeah, I think I know so. However, in the early stages, uh, you know, the reaction to that was from a family perspective. Families were saying, that's ridiculous. I want my husband back. I want my wife back. You know, come on. And in, in Ottawa, National Defense Headquarters, I said, we just got to slow it down. Everybody wants to eat chips and drink Coca-Cola. It's fun, <laughs> right? But sometimes you need to do the right thing. And I think this was the right thing to do. And I'm glad they stuck to it. They say that, for example, for cancer, early diagnosis can make such a huge difference in having a successful outcome. Is it the same way with PTSD? Uh, well, for sure. I think the longer you wait, the worse the condition is to treat. But if we move this away from PTSD, it is true for any mental ill health situation, right? Any condition you suffer from. The minute you realize that you're not doing well, go into care for whatever reason. But what is equally important is the ability to understand that not all conditions uh, are, are the same. Mm -hmm. We live in, again, in a fast food sort of um, social media uh, industry where we consume things so fast, right? And, and now, uh, with this uh, overemphasis on post-traumatic stress disorder, it's not unheard of, and we hear anecdotes of police officers demanding a PTSD diagnosis. Hmm. Now, would you go to your doctor demanding a cancer diagnosis? No, you will go and say, listen, I have issues, right? But you will let the doctor fully assess your situation mm -hmm. and with his or her medical professional advice say, this is the problem. Right? But you might want the certainty of that diagnosis knowing that it will lead to a kind of a treatment that at least gets you on some kind of road, right? But what if you don't have PTSD? What if you don't have it? That's so what if you happen to be in the 50% of those who need help who doesn't have PTSD? You have right. another anxiety problem or you have depression. Mm. Now, if you're the doctor, imagine that. Mm. So the presumptive legislation in Ontario and many provinces has unintentionally caused a situation where people are looking for a specific mm. diagnosis. Now, ask doctors what they think about that. They mm. will probably say, that's not a good idea. Because if you have depression and you think you have PTSD and you're demanding, right? The if you have a broken arm and I diagnose you with a broken leg, yeah, two you're not treatment. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not that different, but again, right? We need, we need to really leave that in the hands of medical professionals. Right? What was the moment when you came back, when you were repatriated, when you first noticed something is really wrong with me and I need help? In hindsight or mm -hmm. the moment? In hindsight, it's clear to me when I look back, when I saw my two children in their pajamas when I came through the door, I, I wasn't, t I was tired. Everybody's tired when they flew a long distance and you're tired, but not tired to the point of collapsing. I emotionally collapsed to my knees in the front hall, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, again, the transition was so difficult. Now, at that moment, the kids never noticed. I basically lowered myself to their level, gave them a hug. Mm -hmm. I was happy. But if I look back, that was the first sign. Within a week, something was going on. But of course, you, we didn't, I didn't know, and you're in denial, you're a tough guy or whatever, whoever you are. And that's a good thing. You know, I say we try to be resilient in the face of adversity. And as we go down, I call it decompensation. You know, you, you sort of start struggling. I think there's something to be said about not rushing to the doctor, right? And trying to figure out when, when is that sweet spot? But within a week, certainly. If somebody would have been a bird, you know, bird on the, would, would have known, right? Family members came to you and said, there's something off about you. Uh, not really. No? Not really. Um, no, and, uh, yeah. You knew it before they did. Well, I think my wife, 
my ex-wife now, but my wife at the time probably knew something. This is not the guy that went to Rwanda. This is not my husband. Mm -hmm. It was just like a, a worst, a, a worse sort of version of me, I guess, if there was a better version. But you know, it was a, there's something different for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. But does that need treatment? Who knows, right? Right. Yeah. You had two conversations with fellow soldiers, Alain Ouellette and Chris Corrigan. Uh, that you described as, quote, the first domino that set off a chain reaction that brought you to greater understanding. Can you tell us what happened there? Absolutely. Uh, the, first, the first one was uh, one day in the office where this, this colleague of mine basically said, Steph, you're going to have to pull your head out of you know where because <laughs> there's something wrong with you. And he shared with me what had happened to him after coming back from Sarajevo, from the very first deployment into Sarajevo. And that was the beginning for me to understand the power of words and the power of another human being who can relate to you because they now give you hope that you're not the only human being going through this. Peer support. Absolutely. The other guy, Chris Corgan, who's uh, vacationing with his family right now down south and we still keep in touch, gave me as a boss the institutional permission I needed to heal, to start healing. I didn't need permission to go to the doctor. But institutionally, we are socialized in our corporations. We go to work every day. We want to do a good job. Until somebody has enough human you know, attributes to say, Steph, I value you. You are a good employee. You're a good officer. We need you healthy. Take some time. That's unheard of. Mm. And so for me, those two moments were instrumental. And this is what we are hoping to do with Corporate Canada. Because everyday Canadians are going through what I went through for very different reasons. But again, you don't have to go to war to d develop these no, issues. No, but I bet it's worse for soldiers because I can't think of people in our society who think of themselves in more macho terms and who think of themselves as being more invulnerable than soldiers. And mm. the notion that you would you know, yield to some kind of mental or emotional disorder is just not in your makeup, is it? So, I partially agree. Okay. You know, you, you're right. When a soldier falls, he falls or she falls really hard because of that image and that, that belief that we're invincible. I'll flip that over now. I think, and I remember having a conversation with uh, a, a soccer dad, and he knew that I was doing the work I was doing, and he knew I'd been to Rwanda. And he tells me, I don't know how you guys do it, you know. And then he shares with me that he's been off on, depre he's depressed and he's off. And I said to him, I said, you know what? It's worse for you. Because at least pe some people around me will say, ah, Steph was in Rwanda, you know, he, no wonder he had a bad time after mm -hmm. that. You don't have the luxury of saying that. Good point. So I think, you know, and again, comparing is such a, not, you're not making a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. But we, we got to stop comparing. The, the fact that we compare is the, the basis of for, for judging and judgment. And judgment needs to be off the table. And we cannot have these minor differences in the pathway of how we lead our lives and how we, we get better or heal or decompensate make a huge difference in how we treat people. We are happy to recommend for anyone's reading, and I would normally say pleasure, but not pleasure in this case, but certainly awareness and greater understanding after the war, surviving PTSD and changing mental health culture. Stéphane Grenier, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, thank you so much for visiting us at TVO tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and thank you for caring. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.